Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Welcome to the review of chapter 4 and chapter 5. As we talked about in the past, I'm going to go pretty quickly with this review because I'm going to try to get through two chapters at once. A lot of your information that you find in this chapter is, I think, really interesting and I think you're going to enjoy reading it. It starts on page, of course, 133, so if you want to follow along in your book, that's fine. If not, you can read the book after. That's totally fine as well. Learning objectives, of course, to describe the stage of listening for chapter four, discuss the four main types of listening, and compare and contrast the four main listening styles. So listening. So when we talk about listening on page 133, it's a learn process of receiving, interpreting, recalling, evaluating, and responding to verbal and nonverbal messages. We talk about each one of these components starting on page 134. Receiving, of course, the intake of stimuli, um, which is the first part of listening. Recalling is the last part. Interpreting is also on page 134. It's making meaning of the stimuli. And then recalling, retrieving the information that you receive. So those are the three parts of the listening process that are, I think, really interesting. Well, the one last part that's discussed here is evaluating. Evaluating is uh, making judgments about messages the credibility, their completeness, their worth, whether or not they're accurate. You know, you determine that within your own mind. And then potentially, this is not something that always happens, but responding on page 136. Um, responding entails sending verbal and nonverbal messages that indicate attentiveness and understanding or lack thereof. Um, I'm sure we all have examples of responding to people in ways especially with nonverbal cues that make them you know, understand that we are not grasping what they're saying. This happens a lot when um, you know, potentially in educational settings. So it's up to the teacher to make sure that they watch you know, that type of communication, nonverbal, to make sure what they're trying to teach. So moving on to slide number eight here. Importance of listening. It is important, right? It helps us achieve communication goals. It helps us play a role in professional and civic and personal context, right? Also academic as well. Uh, listening is one of the most key influential pieces to the communication process. Um, I ask a lot of people when I teach this class, uh, how do you learn? And a lot of people will say, I learn by reading. Some will say I learn by listening. Others might say I learn by doing it myself. I personally learn by listening. So this chapter means, you know, more to me than it would, you know, potentially someone that learns in a different manner. However, it's always, always important for us to make sure we understand the importance of listening and what uh, it can entail for a successful communication process. All right, here's the listening types that we talked about. These will be in a test. So discriminative listening, informational listening, critical listening, and empathetic listening. Each one of them are very important. It starts on one page 137. They serve many purposes and different situations require different types of listening, right? Uh, the listening type that we engage in affects our communication and how we respond to others and how others respond to us. So be sure to look over these. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them because we have a lot of slides to go through here. Um, we talked about listening types and listening styles. So people-oriented listeners, action-oriented listeners, context Content-oriented listeners and time-oriented listeners are, you know, all different types of styles that listening really adheres to. Um, I guess it could depend when you read this chapter after I read it. I really took into consideration your listening style might differ depending on the situation that you're in. So when you review these listening styles, understand that not everyone has that style 24-7, in my opinion. I think your style can change depending on what you want to get out of the situation. All right, moving on to 4.2. What are some barriers to effective listening, right? There can always be physical barriers, cognitive, personal barriers. Maybe you didn't prepare enough. That's one of the bullet points here. Uh, maybe it's a bad speaker. Maybe the messages that they're sending are not being conveyed in the way they're supposed to. Maybe there's bad listening practices. Maybe you're not paying attention. Maybe there's, you know, we talk about environmental barriers. Maybe you have your computer on in class and you're not really uh, 
paying attention to what the teacher says. Maybe you have a news article up or something that that finds more interest to you at that time. That could be a barrier to listening. Um, environmental and physical barriers, just as we talked about, um, that is on page 142. Um, that's usually the biggest barrier that we see. I'm, I'm sure we've all been in a place where we're like, I don't want to listen. I'm not in the mood for this. I don't really want to learn today. And that's a psychological noise that stems from our psychological state, including mood and level of arousal, can facilitate and impede listening. That's on page 143. So what type of mood you're in will really determine how you're going to learn, how you're going to listen, and what you get out of potentially a lecture or the environment that you're in during that time. So cognitive and personal barriers are also uh, important aspects of the listening process. The one thing I got out of that section is the difference between speech and thought rate. Our ability to process more information than what comes from the speaker or source creates a barrier to effective listening. While people speak at a rate of 125 to 175 words per minute, we can process between 400 and 800 words per minute. The gap between speech rate and thought rate gives us an opportunity to, to side process any number of thoughts that can be distracting from a more important message. So that says our brain works faster than what people can speak. So when we're listening to someone, you're going to have different thoughts in your head potentially of something else. And when you're thinking of something other than what the speaker is trying to present, sometimes that can impact the listening process. We've all been there. We've all thought about that. You know, if you're sitting down to watch TV, as an example, you know, if it's not a good show, you might be thinking about something else. Something else might be going on. A lot of people are on their phone at the same time they're watching TV, trying to listen to the show. And also, of course, uh, maybe look at social media or something of that nature. So that is a cognitive and personal barrier. Although it can also be, that example can also be an environmental barrier as well. Uh, lack of listening preparation. Um, the U.S. culture, really interestingly enough, focus more on speaking than listening, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's not like that in every culture, but uh, listening, I think, is an important aspect that should not be taken lightly. This lecture, knowing that listening is not a chore, it's really important. It's an important aspect of learning, and I think that if you're able to improve listening, like you improve communication, because it is a part of communication, you will be an effective learner. And being a learner is an important part of being someone that's successful in life. Bad speakers, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. The message could be bad. Uh, that's another impact of listening, right? Bad listening practice. Maybe you interrupt people. Maybe it's distorted. Maybe it occurs uh, when we recall information incorrectly in our own mind. You know, Part of that is making sure we take notes, making sure we maybe record the video um, or record the um, speaker. That's an important part of the listening practice just to spur our mind and our thought in order to understand what the speaker is trying to present. Eavesdropping, aggressive listening, those are all examples of bad listening practice as well. Uh, narcissistic listening, maybe it's self-centered uh, and pseudo-listening. Maybe you're not really paying attention uh, to what the speaker is trying to say. We're not going to go into each stage in 4.3 because I want to move on to chapter 5, but Listening at each stage is super important and make sure you take a look at each one of these. They're not, um, from my understanding, in a test. They probably are in homework, so uh, be sure to read the chapter so that you understand this part of the material. All right, we're going to move on to the next chapter. And uh, we kind of scooted through this, but becoming a better listener, we've already talked about empathetic, you know, making sure that you feel what other people are saying and making sure that you take into consideration, especially in the healthcare world, how important it is to understand what people are saying and also feel their pain. That's part of empathetic uh, listening, and it's part of a skill that you need to develop over time in order to be effective at any healthcare job. The interpersonal communication. Be sure to take a look at the chapter. There's a lot of great information in here, stuff that we don't often study. Some, some of it could be a little new. However, also make sure you take a look at the other resources that I put in the course content. That's going to be super helpful for your understanding. So moving on to interpersonal communication. It's a process of exchanging messages between people 
who live mutually and influence one another in unique ways in relation to social and cultural norms. Interpersonal communication. So interpersonal communication confidence is our ability to communicate effectively and appropriately within our personal relationships. So how do we communicate with people that are closest to us? We already talked about moving through uh, functional aspects a little bit from the goals that we think about in relation to interpersonal communication. Review those. I'm going to move on right now into uh, objectives 5.2 interpersonal conflict. So this is what we think about sometimes when we're studying interpersonal communication, but this is not the only component of communicating in an interpersonal way. There's books that you can read on conflict, right? Healthy conflict is important, but it's interactions where their people have real or perceived incompatible goals. So someone, of course, wants one situation and another person wants a different situation. So the incompatibility there can be seen as conflict. There is uh, healthy conflict. That's why it's listed right here. There's not inherently negative context to this. So make sure when you're reading this, you understand that. And I think that's an important part of communication that I see in society today is lacking. Having interpersonal conflict uh, and also having debate is an important part of an understanding and moving in a direction where we work together to come up with a solution. And you don't often see that in society today. I really love this slide. So the five styles of interpersonal conflict manage management, uh, competing, collaborating, accommodating, avoiding, and hopefully we get to a point of compromising. When you're working with someone and you come up with a solution that works for everyone, that would be compromising. However, sometimes you have to go through the stages in order to get to that compromising part. Some people compromise a lot easier, others fight a little bit longer in order to get what they want, but it's all part of the interpersonal conflict management process. So I like to have this, especially uh, I have it hanging in my office to understand that healthy conflict is a part of effective communication. Hopefully in your discussion post, um, and I know we don't have one every week, but we do this week, hopefully you can talk about conflict management in that discussion post. However, that is your choice from the perspective of understanding what it takes to have a healthy conflict management uh, situation. I think that's important for all of us. So this goes over each term, right? We, I would assume that many of you already know what these are. We've already talked about collaboration, so I'm not going to highlight that too much more. All right, moving on to culture and page 180. Page 180. Face Face work, individual cultures, and collective cultures are all points that we need to talk about really quickly. Is the project, projected self we desire to put in the world? Face work refers to the communicative strategies we employ to project, maintain, or repair our uh, face. And then individual, individualistic cultures are, as an example, like the United States and most of Europe emphasize individual identity over group identity and encourage competition and self-reliance. Collectivistic cultures like Taiwan, China, Japan, Vietnam, and Peru, and probably others, value in-group identity rather than individual identity and value uh, conformity to social norms in the in-group. So there's differences, right, depending on where you're at. The United States has a different culture than some of these others and that's important to know especially from the perspective of communicating effectively depending on the region that you're in all right uh, we're not going to talk about triggers but conflict tr triggers are talked about on page 181 make sure you review those really really uh, interesting moving on to 5.3 here we talk about emotions uh, primary and secondary emotions on page 185 you know that's something that I think is critical for all of us to understand, but be sure to review that on page 185. I'm about to skip there, but we're moving on to theories of self-disclosure. What are you disclosing to others when you communicate with them? And this window, I think, is super important for you to think about from the perspective of what are you open with in your communication and what are you hiding? So be sure to review that on page 192. Really a great summary of these two chapters. I hope it wasn't too quick. Be sure to read the book. If you do, it'll really flow nicely. I look forward to working with you. Any questions, please reach out. Thanks so much.